Blessed are those who don't walk in the way of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But my delight is in your law, Lord. I meditate on it day and night. You make me like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Because of you, whatever I do prospers. The wicked are not that way. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Lord, you watch over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Well, hey, Heritage. I want to welcome you all across the network as we step into our summer series, Psalms, Prayers from the Heart. I'm really excited about this journey for a number of reasons. One is to be able to hear from other members of the team as we lean into these scriptures, but also just as it follows on the heels of the other series we've been doing, this fits perfectly to step into this Prayers from the Heart conversation. Now, we're going to spend our time today, about half the time is going to be setting up the entire series, and another half digging down into our first psalm for our journey together. But one of the things I understand about the book of Psalms, it's one of the more familiar books of the Bible. Yet there are some misperceptions about what it is and how it came about. See, it's actually a collection of collections. It, it, it spans centuries of time. It was originally used as a prayer book in temple worship until the first century came around and it became the, known as the book of Psalms. And the name Psalms actually comes from a Greek word. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek, which is called the Septuagint, that's where the name Psalms came from. And it, and it comes from words that speak to stringed instruments like harps and, and later to instrumental music that accompanies alongside. But the Hebrew words for this book of praise and prayer are very different. It's not Psalms, they're different. Yet this book contains some of the deepest expressions of joy and sorrow, honesty, and heartfelt expressions to God. It's a, it's a powerful compilation. It's a book that speaks to us and for us even today. Even today. But as a collection of collections, it's not just one book, it's actually a book of books. There's five books that form underneath this thing we know as the book of Psalms. Five separate books contained within. The first book, for example, runs from chapter 1 to chapter 41, and the rest of them run in very similar fashion after that. Now, some people think that these five books were designed to mirror the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. And that's kind of cool to think about. But it could have been they just designed it with this five-book structure to be able to facilitate liturgical worship, public worship. Either way, to mirror the first five books or just to facilitate public worship, this is a book of poetry, of praise and prayer from, from start to finish. And it allows us to understand and know the heart of God as we lean into it and understand it all the more. Now, within the five books, there are actually types of psalms. Just want to hit those quickly. There's a different list with lots of different structure, but the primary or common five types of psalms are, are psalms or hymns of psalms of praise, psalms of lament, thanksgiving, royal psalms, and wisdom psalms. You will find other lists that break it out into like 10 or 12 different types. These are the most common categorizations of the psalms. And if you want to get more simple, we want to just want to break it down. There are actually just two types of psalms. There are praise and there are lament. Every other psalm can fit under that umbrella. We can get more detailed in breaking them out, but it's praise and lament. And in fact, a third, a third of the psalms are lament. And there's 150 prayers from the heart that can connect to our hearts today and our lives today. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited to spend some time as a church family walking through this incredible collection of collections, this book of books. Now, one of the two things that we often think about when we think about Psalms is that we often think that it's the longest book of the Bible and that it was written by David. I thought that as a kid, but neither are true. The, actually, the longest book of the Bible and has the most words is the book of Jeremiah. The second longest book of the Bible is Genesis. And the third longest book of the Bible is Psalms. Now, in addition to that, David, although he wrote many Psalms and was known as the sweet psalmist of Israel did not write the book of Psalms. 
he wrote roughly half of what is included in the collection of collections known as the book of Psalms, 73 to be exact, of the 150. And even though he wrote them, he isn't even the one who put them all together because many of the Psalms were written hundreds of years after he died. What we do know is that there were seven different, at least seven different authors. David wrote the most. He wrote 73. But then there was a man named Asaph who wrote about 12. Then you have the sons of Korah, which is a family. They wrote about 11. But then you hit Solomon, and Solomon was the son of David. He wrote two. Beyond that are Ethan and Haman. They each wrote one. And Haman was actually the, one of the grandsons of the prophet Samuel, which is kind of cool. And he ended up working for David. But then even a psalm that Moses wrote is included in this book of books, collection of collections, which leaves about 50 psalms that are anonymous, not attributed to anybody. They're sometimes called the orphan psalms. And, and it could have been that they were written by one person, all of them, but most likely they're written by many people over many years. But here's the thing, regardless of who wrote them, this book of books, this book of praise and prayers speaks to God in praise and speaks to God in prayers. And it positions us to understand and know what it is to live by faith, what it is to live in trust, and it gives us great insight into the character of God. Great insight. Lots of things about the character of God. Now, one of the reasons that this book is so popular is it allows us to really process and deal with things we deal with today, real, real realities in life, real-time stuff. If we're dealing with loss or conflict or trouble, if we're if we're dealing with success or victory or something joy-filled, we can go to the Psalms. If we're happy, we can read the Psalms. If, if we're grateful, we can read the Psalms. If we're filled to overflowing with joy, we can go and read the Psalms. At the same time, if we're sad, we can read the Psalms. If we're hurting, we can read the Psalms. If we're struggling, if we're despairing, if we're being attacked, if we're even just struggling to make sense of life, we can read the Psalms. The Psalms in and of themselves just provide this unique collection of perspective into the character of God. There's almost a bit of a Psalm for every occasion dynamic. But we need to know how to study it. It's easily found because it's kind of in the middle of most Bibles. You open it up, there you are, you're in Psalms. <laughs> but we need to know how to study it. Because how to study the Psalms is not to do what many people do, which is close your eyes, open it up, and point. <laughs> We've done it, people. I've done it. Come on now. If you've ever opened up Psalms, hope to drop in and God is going to speak to you from that moment. Raise your hand. Get it up high. Come on, Bettendorf. Yeah, we do it. I've done it. It's easy to do and it can be helpful because the truth is all scripture is useful and God can choose to work in that moment. But I'm going to tell you something. It is much more effective to have an intentional approach to reading scripture and reading the Psalms than some random one because we find more. We learn more. We understand more. And it can be a lot less complicated than the random point and just go. I want to show you an example of this. It actually comes from, it's a video clip from Tim Hawkins, who's a, just a fantastic Christian comedian. And, and uh, I got to apologize, the video quality is a little poor, but he's actually killing time at the end of a show for some people to get on platform. And he's telling a story. He's telling the story of interacting with fans after a different show and what he did in that space. So just sit back and take a look. But I was in church a few years ago, I was in this big gig, it was like 1,500 people, and it went really, it went pretty good. I did okay, and uh, there was a big line of people asking for my autograph after the show. And I'm like, I was homeschooled, I could do this. So the first lady, she walks up to me, she goes, would you put your favorite Bible verse underneath your name for me? And I was like, uh-huh. So I took it, and I was like, Tim, my favorite verse is Psalm 34, verse 8. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good, happy are those who take refuge in him. But that night, I forgot the verse. I just blank. You know how sometimes your mind blanks? You know, like when you were dressing today. You know what I'm talking about? You know, it's just like, what am I doing? And so anyway, I was like, I had to pick. I can't just write the Bible, you know. I knew it was a psalm, so it was a psalm. I just picked a psalm. So I picked, okay, Psalm 38, 7. I said, that can't be a bad one. So I, like an idiot, I did them all like that. So Tim Hawkins, Psalm 38, 7. <laughs> I'm driving home that night, and I'm like, oh, no. I hope that was a good verse. Oh, Lord, help me. So I get home and I look up Psalm 38, 7 in my Bible. And to my horror, it says, Lo, I have a painful disease in my loins. Yeah, yuck it up, Christians. That's real funny, isn't it? 
Lo, I have a painful disease in my life. Did you know that's in the Bible? I do now. And I signed it a hundred times and sent it out into my own little mission field. Take the word of my loin problem. Because you know they looked it up when they went home. You know they did. You see, lady, come on, y'all. We're going to read this first. Turn the TVs off. Sit around. I'm going to read it. It's his life first. I think I got it here. Shh. Lo, I have a painful disease. I shook his hand. <laughs> you believe that? Some of you don't get that. Lo, I have a painful disease in my Lord. You ain't going to see that verse cross-stitched on a pillow. <laughs> That's just a special pillow, I guess. I don't know. All right, again. <laughs> hey, listen. Maybe the random approach to Psalms isn't the way to go. I'd be a little more complicated than we realize. But look. This series is designed to give us some handholds, a bit of a roadmap to fully engaging the Psalms and discovering all that God has laid out in that part of Scripture. They can help us process real things in life, but also position us to understand who God is and His heart for us. So we're going to spend some time talking about how to study Psalms throughout the course of the series, but we're also going to study a few psalms along the way. And today, as we kick off this summer series, we're going to spend about half our time setting up how we do the studying part, and then we're going to get into studying one of the psalms, which is the first psalm in the book of Psalms itself. But before we do that, I just want to emphasize something about how to approach Scripture. See, it's, it's really important to not only do it, but it helps to be intentional in it. And one of the ways that we recommend and then like how to, how to read scripture is to follow a, just a three-step process, which is just observe, interpret, apply. It, it, look at just what does it say? What does it mean? And then what do I do about it? How, what, what do I do next? How do I live now as a result? Observe, interpret, apply. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have a method by which you engage scripture, to consider using this. It's easy to remember. It's simple to follow. And I encourage you to weave prayer into all of it. This is the word of God. So we should be talking to him about it when we're trying to study it. So I encourage you to weave in prayer where you pray and then observe. You pray and then interpret. You, you pray and then apply. When you do that, you're positioned to take in the word of God more fully and understand it. Because I got to tell you, taking in the word of God to me is like trying to take in the ocean. I don't, I'm sure we've had different experiences with the ocean, but how we experience the ocean matters. Because quite honestly, we could Google the ocean and come up with some pictures, right? and get some sense of what it is. We can be in a plane, we can fly over the ocean, and look down and see its immensity and how wide and just broad it is. We can even be in a boat cruising across the surface of the ocean and experiencing dynamics around it. We could stand on the shore and we could put our toes in the water a bit. We could go swimming in the ocean. We can grab some snorkel gear and go a bit further out and a bit deeper down. We can even put on some scuba gear and go down even further. The more we engage the ocean, the more we discover. I got to tell you, I'm a scuba diver. My son Josh and I have been doing this for almost 10 years. Love it. I never get tired of, of looking over the edge of the boat and, and, and from the surface seeing shapes and dark blobs, just things down below, and then, and then dropping in the water and then slowly sinking down deeper and deeper. And the closer I get to the bottom, that blob turns into a reef shape and that reef turns into colors and turns into creatures and plants and all kinds of an ecosystem. And to get down below and to linger in that space and to experience not only the beauty, but the nuances and the intricacies of how that whole thing interacts. I never get tired of that. And I share that with you because that's exactly what it is to know how to study scripture. We can, we can do a Google, Google search of Scripture and get a picture or two. We can cruise across the surface on our way somewhere else and get some experience from it, just like a boat or a plane. And we can stand on the edge and we can dip our toe in or we can go in deep and we can linger longer because the more we engage, the longer we linger, the more we discover. But quite honestly, most people don't linger long enough to see and understand the the nuances and the 
texture and the breadth and width of what is in God's word. But our series, Psalms, Prayers from the Heart, is an opportunity to change that. The Psalms give us great insight into the character of God. It's a treasury of insight into the character of God. And when we're willing to observe, interpret, apply, and pray in and around all that, man, we begin to experience scripture like never before. I'm excited to see how he's gonna work and move as we dive deep, dip and dive into the, the Psalms this summer. And it'll help us as we study scripture in other places of the Bible. But let me just kind of frame something about approach to the Psalms. And you can make some notes in your notes section if you want to. But there's a couple of things to consider when we start to study the Psalms. To ask ourselves what type it is. Is, is this a wisdom Psalm? Is this a, a, song, a Psalm of lament? What type is it? It's also good to consider the author, who wrote it, because it gives us some some backstory and some headspace of where they're coming from, which allows us to then understand the context. Okay, what's the context that this is written? Because there are specific psalms that are written directly out of specific moments that occurred. And then there's this idea of studying structure. And we're going to do a lot more of this through the rest of our series because there, there are psalms that are acrostics. There are, there are things called parallelism. There's just lots of unique things because the book of psalms is a book of prayer and praise, but it is essentially also a book of poetry. One of the m- most famous po- elements of poetry are in the book of psalms. This is an important place to start when we begin to understand and and begin to read Scripture and specifically the Psalms. But today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually look at book number one, Psalm 1. And in book number one, there are 41 Psalms. 37 are attributed to David. Of the four that are not attributed to David... Two of them are intro psalms. They specifically introduce the book, and they are Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, which takes us to where we're going today in Psalm 1 itself. Now, just as a bit of a public service announcement, because I always want you guys to, to be able to be seen as what you, like you know what you're doing and you understand what's going on. Here's the public service announcement. A book or collection of these things is, are called psalms. Say that with me. Psalms. There you go. A book or collection is psalms. When you have only one psalm, it is a psalm, no S. P is silent, drop the S. Say psalm. Psalm. There you go. Now you got it. Just one is a psalm. A whole book is psalms. Now you know how to engage with the psalms. Are you ready to engage Psalm 1? All right, let's go. Grab your Bibles, get your note guides. You can follow along here on the screen. Psalm 1, the very first psalm, book 1, sets up the entire book of of prayers and praises, is not a psalm of praise. It's not even a call to praise. It's a call to righteousness, (laughs) which may seem kind of weird, that setting up this whole book is specifically a call to righteousness. But the truth of the matter is devotion always precedes true praise. Devotion always precedes true praise. And the psalmist who wrote this understood it. So we're starting with Psalm 1. It is a wisdom psalm. It is written by an anonymous psalmist. And its context is introducing this book of books, this collection of collections. So let me pray, and then we'll step into this. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we begin to step into this, that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear what you want us to see and hear. May you speak, may your spirit move, and may we leave from this place different because we have experienced your word, filled our mind with it, and allowed it to be hidden in our hearts today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's jump in. Psalm 1. Verse 1, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So here's the thing. One of the most, or two of the most simple questions, most relevant questions to ask anytime we read Scripture is, what does it say about God and what does it say about us? To be able to ask those questions anytime we lean into Scripture is hugely helpful. 
the Bible is God's revelation of himself to us. So it's appropriate to expect that when we read it, we're going to learn something about him and we can learn something about who we are in front of him. So asking what does it say about him and what does it say about us, really good questions to start into any scripture. And as we lean into studying this passage, we're going to have a couple of fill-ins. You'll find them in your note guide if you're using that at the bottom underneath so what. We're going to hit those along the way as we lean into unpacking Psalm 1. And it starts with understanding what the psalmist knew as he wrote the beginning of this first book of Psalms, first psalm. Proximity shapes identity. He understood that proximity shapes identity. Who we hang with matters. Who we sit in proximity to has an impact on us. It informs who we are. And Psalm 1 starts, blessed is the one who doesn't walk, stand, or sit in certain places. To walk, stand, or sit in certain places. Proximity shapes identity, for better or for worse. Now, this idea of being blessed is literally supremely happy is the definition, or fulfilled. Supremely happy or fulfilled. And the original Hebrew word from which we get blessed is actually plural, which means there's either an array or a list of blessings or a convergence of blessings. For those who do not walk, stand, or sit in certain spaces with certain dynamics. Now, I think all of us want to be supremely happy. (laughs) I think we do. But that is reserved for those who do not walk, stand, or sit in proximity in places that will lead them to have their identity shaped in a way it shouldn't be shaped. And that standing, sitting, and walking dynamic could really be connected to how we think, how we behave, and, and really where we belong. Because the godly and the ungodly think differently, they behave differently, and they actually belong in community and connection differently. They're connected differently. And there are things that the righteous should do, and there are things that the righteous should not do. And one of the dynamics of what they should do is really understanding what they should pursue. And if we want to be blessed, if we want to be supremely happy, we need to know what or who we should pursue because it ultimately matters and it shapes us. Proximity shapes identity. Now, I want to be really clear. There's a difference in this conversation about where we grow and where we go to help others grow. There's a difference between where we rest and where we reach. And if we don't understand the difference, we can drift into unhealthy paradigms because the moment that we don't live a life that includes both, we drift outside of God's approval. See, God created us for himself, and he sends us for himself. There's a difference between where we rest or where we root and where we reach or where we risk. And this psalm is not talking about stepping away from or divesting ourselves of anybody who doesn't walk with God. This psalm is talking about where we, where we rest, where we root. It's not addressing where we risk or reach. That's an entirely different conversation. It's not about leaving those who don't walk with God and saying, I'm going to be over here and I'm not going to engage with you. There's a problem whenever we drift to one side or the other. If we drift over here where we just rest and root and we never engage in the mission God's given us, we become monastic. We isolate ourselves and we ultimately become irrelevant to what God calls us to do. If we go way over here and we just risk and reach all the time, but we're not rooted and resting in Him, well, now we sit in a proximity in a space where we become changed by the thing we're near and we're not rooted and resting over here, that proximity shapes our identity. This psalm is talking about where we rest and where we root. And when we rest and root in proximity to him, well, then we become a a tree that blossoms and grows. But let's take a look what happens next in verse 2. But those, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. So it's not, you know, not people who go over here and rest and root where they shouldn't walk, stand, or sit, but rest or root in, in, in Him. They take pleasure in pursuit of Him. There is delight. There's pursuit of Him. But they also, in pursuit around the law, meditate on His law. Now, there's two things, I think, in verse 2 that get a little uncomfortable for us. Understanding, one, the law is everything that God has ever said to His people. It's not just the first five books of the Bible. It's everything God has ever said to His people for us to engage in. The second part that I think we kind of struggle around is this idea of meditation. I think it feels odd for us to think and talk about meditating. But listen, it is a legitimate biblical spiritual discipline. But it's not often what people think it is in practice. 
See, Eastern meditation is not what we're talking about. Eastern meditation is all about emptying your mind of everything. Christian biblical meditation is about filling your mind with his word. Filling ourselves with him. Eastern meditation says, empty yourself of everything, have nothing, be attached to nothing. Biblical meditation is about filling, filling our mind with his word. And when we fill our mind with his word, well, now we understand who he is and what he wants us to do. We, we meditate and fill ourselves with his word by thinking about everything he has said, every phrase, every word. We just process, go down deep into it. We talk to him about what he's saying and we talked about how he wants us to live as a result. That biblical meditation is a legitimate spiritual discipline. And if we're ever going to actually achieve something worthwhile in life, we need to have ourselves rooted in his word. And that discipline of meditation is part of it. Because ultimately, when we're rooted in God's word, we can truly thrive. When you and I take time to, to drop down deep into his word and understand the nuances and see the, the intricacies of it, when we are rooted in his word, we're able to thrive. We're able to experience the joy of, of living in proximity to him. When we're rooted in God's word, it allows us to thrive in life. And we, when we meditate on his word day and night, when we examine every facet of it, we relish every insight into his character, then we begin to experience the breadth and width and depth of his love and the truth of his word. But many people actually miss what's available because they only read scripture and they never meditate on it. They only ever do a Google search. They only ever do a surface cruise by and never drop down in and sit and linger long enough to meditate on what he's saying for him to speak deeper truths into our lives. But those who do, whoever's willing to do this, they will be that green fruitful tree. Look with me in verse three. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prospers. Whatever they do thrives. Listen, life is hard and we very easily can get to a place where we wither when the demands and the challenges and the heartbreaks and the setbacks all creep in. We can just start to wither. But when we are rooted in him, when we rest and root in him, we don't have to wither at all no matter the circumstances. A tree that's planted next to a, a source of water never has to wither because it has everything it needs and it, can, and it can bear its fruit in season. It can develop strength and stability as its roots go deeper down. It can prosper, it can thrive, and so can we. When we are rooted and resting in Jesus, we're then positioned to be able to risk and reach as well. But it's both and, but it's rooted in Him where we're able to thrive in the complexities of life. But I want to be careful that we don't get caught up in thinking that that idea of being prosperous or a prosper word leads us to think that there is no failure or difficulty when we're rooted in him, because that's not what it means. There is. Probably one of the easiest ways to understand this is if you look at a field of grain, if you're ever going to harvest the fruit of that field, three things need to happen to those plants. First, they get cut. Second, they get crushed. And third, they're thrown in the air so it separates the wheat from the chaff. Cut, crushed, and thrown to yield and bring forth fruit. That's a very dynamic and not so comfortable process, right? <laughs> to be cut, to be crushed, and thrown is not comfortable, but it's where the fruit is yielded. And that's often why comfort is the enemy of kingdom because we get into spaces where we can be cut and crushed and we can be thrown, where God is actually purifying and God is pulling out the fruit and we can resist that stuff because we think the discomfort is something we shouldn't lean into. But being cut and crushed and tossed is often part of yielding the fruit that he wants to see and take place in our lives. And we're willing to sit in that process. What happens is that the wicked are like chaff that the wind blows away, the stuff that is temporary and useless. There's a very stark difference between a, a vibrant, growing, green, fruitful tree and chaff that is temporary and useless. One can yield fruit. One doesn't have purpose, and it's removed. Fruit actually matters in our lives. Jesus talked about fruit. He did it in Matthew 7, very specifically. Here's what he said. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. 
Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So Jesus is using the metaphor of a tree and fruit to talk about people, us, in our lives, and how we live. And good trees bear good fruit, bad trees bear bad fruit. He's speaking to issues of the heart. He's speaking to his power at work in our lives. And bearing fruit is an issue that takes place regardless of season. It can. In some ways, what Jesus is saying is he's indicating that the bearing fruit is not optional. That we're supposed to bear fruit. And the reality is that when we linger, when we're rooted and resting in Him, where we linger determines the kind of fruit that we can bear. But when we linger and rest in Him, when we walk and stand and sit in proximity to Him, we can bear fruit in every season. Because it's about where we're rooted. It's about the source of strength and the source of power they live by. It's not about our circumstances. We, we're to bear fruit. The question that comes to my mind is, what's my fruit? What, what's the fruit of your life? Good trees bear good fruit, and it's because of where we're rooted. It's where we're getting our, our source of purpose and our source of power. It's where we rest so that we can reach, so we can risk. So what's the fruit of your life? Listen, you've got to understand a principle here of understanding how circumstances play into this. Circumstance doesn't depict favor. Fruit does. Circumstances don't depict favor. Fruit does. I think too many times people start to lean into understanding who God is and His will for them, and they start to measure the wrong things. They start to look at how easy it's going, how, how comfortable it is, uh, how well it's working, is it devoid of problems, or is there, is there trouble? And if, if it's devoid, then it is God. Listen, that's not how that works. It's not the circumstances of our life that depict His favor. It's the fruit of our lives that do, that do and does. So what's the fruit of your life? Circumstances don't depict His favor. Fruit does. Because he's the one that helps us bear fruit. And the Psalms are filled with people who, who are in spaces of deep, desperate despair, difficult circumstances, and were able to step into places of celebration and joy and bear fruit even out of those difficult places. Bearing good fruit out of bad fields because we're a good tree rooted in him, resting in him. Circumstances don't depict favor, fruit does. And, a, and it, you can bear the same kind of fruit that those psalmists were able to experience. Because bearing fruit is about being rooted into the stream, next to that stream in every season. Bearing fruit in the appointed time when we're supposed to, even in the hard seasons. Even in the difficult seasons, we bear fruit. And every time we do, as we remain in that space, our roots go deeper. We get more connected to the source. We gain more stability, gain more strength in our reliance and dependence on Him. And our fruit even grows as we go deeper and deeper in Him. And we can bear fruit in any and every season because it's not dependent on circumstances. It's dependent on where we're rooted. And in verse 6 reminds us, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. This happens because He watches over the way of the righteous. He knows the way of the righteous. He walks with and He stands with and He sits with the righteous. Those who know and those who follow. Circumstances don't depict favor. Fruit does. And that idea of the Lord watching over, that, that verb could actually be more literally trans, translated, God cherishes the way of the righteous. He knows it, he sees it, he walks, he stands, he sits with. Now, Psalm 1 tells us that God has revealed himself by his word, which tells us several things. One, we can know him and he wants to be known. The second thing is that we can obey and he wants us to obey. When God reveals himself in his word, he wants to be known and we can know. He wants us to obey and we can obey. In his power when we remain rooted, resting in him, we can flourish despite any circumstance we sit in and he will bless those who honor, who are, whose passion is to know him and obey him. And those who wander have a very different path before them. They become chaff, blown away. He rewards devotion. Devotion always precedes true praise. And what we're talking about, being rested and rooted here and not walking, standing, and sitting over here, but still risking and reaching over here, that's all about choices. It's about making decisions for where we invest. And when you and I, the more we delight in God, the more fruitful we become. The more we actually delight in Him, the more fruitful we actually become. When we, when we 
demonstrate devotion and obedience, that precedes true praise. And in that dynamic of being rooted and resting in him, he begins to move. There's a huge difference between being a tree who bears fruit and chaff that's blown away. One has deep roots connected to the Father. The other is surfacy and not connected. And I think there's a bit of a challenge in our culture today where we're, we're fairly superficial in how we interact with, with neighbors and people in the store, but that superficiality, I think, has drifted into our relationships with friends, even into our family, into our marriages. And if we're not careful, it'll drift far enough down that we become superficial with God. And we throw cliches at him and we call it prayer. But the psalmists, the psalmists were people who did not engage with cliches. They shared out a heartfelt honesty, raw realities in their world. They confessed sin. They cried out in desperation. They, they struggled in the complexities of life, but they did it with deep honesty. They did it with transparency because they understood that God already knew, but they were crying out to him in lament, in praise with that transparency that often we lack. And part of my prayer for us is that we would engage in this series in a manner where the honesty of the psalmist will lead us to step into a deeper, more intimate relationship with God ourselves. That we won't be content with a Google search of his word. We won't be content with standing on the edge, dipping our toes in, but we wanna get out in it and go as deep and linger as long as we possibly can so that we can experience the breadth and width of his word. So we can fill ourselves with his word hide ourselves in his word so that we have everything we need to never wither but to bear fruit in every season. My prayer is that we would do that as a people. Let the honesty of the Psalms lead us into deep and genuine relationship with him. One of the ways I want to encourage you to think about doing that is to read a Psalm a day. Think about reading a Psalm a day. There's 150. We just looked at one. You got 149 to go. You read a Psalm a day, you'll be reading them well past this series being over. But I encourage you to read a psalm a day. Incorporate, observe, interpret, apply, and prayer intermixed in all of that. And create space to sit and linger. I'm confident God will work and move in your life in ways you've not yet seen, if you're willing to do that. But one of the most and best ways to approach God is in obedience. Devotion always precedes true praise. And one of the ways that we can demonstrate obedience is taking part in the sacrament of communion. As we begin this series in the study of Psalms, we're going to set aside just a couple of moments to take part in the obedient action of remembering the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrament of communion. Jesus set this whole thing up with his disciples as a means of remembering what he did, his sacrifice. On the night that he was betrayed, he, he took bread, he took cup, and he said, look, this is my broken body, this is my shed blood, take, this, take these things and do this in remembrance of me. We know this, we've done this, this is a regular practice for us as a church. But today as we begin this series, there's a unique component to this for me. It's an opportunity to express devotion as it precedes true praise. It's an opportunity to declare that we want to walk and stand and sit with him. That we want to be rooted and resting in him and experience the fullness of what it means to walk in relationship to him. I invite all of you to take part in this. You don't have to be a member of this church to take part in this. The only prerequisite is that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. If he's not your Lord and Savior, feel free to let the elements pass in a few moments, or you can actually pray the prayer and walk through the steps in the back of your note guide and then turn around and take part in this today. But this is for those who profess Jesus as Lord, and it is an opportunity for us to say, man, I choose to walk, stand, and sit with you, Lord. I, I want to express devotion to you by remembering what you did and taking time in this space to just maybe detox or position ourselves before him in a right heart because maybe we came in today with some junk. But in a few moments all across our network, the ushers are gonna come and they're gonna pass some trays in front of us. Make sure you reach in and grab both cups. They're double stacked cups. One holds a representation of the bread, the other holds the cup. And then hold those elements for a little bit. You'll end up taking them on your own. But I invite you to create a space where you can walk, you can stand, or you can sit. You can kneel. You can find a spot in the worship area or just lay out prostrate all along the ground. But I encourage you to use this time of remembrance of the sacrifice of Jesus, his broken body, his shed blood, to declare your devotion, but also to declare your willingness to, to walk and stand and sit with him. Because when we walk and stand with, sit with him, he walks and stands and sits with us. And we experience the fullness of his love and his power at work in our lives. 
So as the ushers come, our worship teams are going to lead us in a song during this time. So I encourage you, you can sit, you can stand, you can walk, you can kneel. But in this space and time, you can worship however you feel led. You will take the elements on your own. So once you get them, you can take them after you've spent that time in prayer. Take them on your own, but then engage in worship with the rest of the community because this is a community. Maybe people have made some mistakes. We've sinned, but people who are chasing to walk and stand and sit, sit next to the Father and being rooted in Him. So as the ushers come and our worship team come, join me in prayer, please. Father, I thank you that your Son loved us enough to come, to live, die, and rise again. And by His broken body and shed blood, we can be made whole. God, we've all sinned and fallen short of your glory. We've, we've all done that. But by Jesus, we can be made whole and pure. We can be washed clean. And today, as we take these elements, we do so to remember. We do so to acknowledge, to worship, but also to declare that we want to walk and stand and sit with you. That, that we want to be devoted, wholly devoted to you. And may our devotion lead to true praise in our lives. I love you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.